so let's uh, let's why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Let's pray together. Father, we just want to thank you for the wonder of of your love, for your faithfulness uh, towards us uh, in our lives, Lord. On this journey, we we reflect and. Lord, we just look and, and in wonder, uh, say thank you, Lord, thank you that you've redeemed us, that you've rescued us, that you continue to to lead us and guide us patiently, and Lord, you are just so good to us, and as we we come tonight, we do so uh, seeking for you, Lord, to, to, we come because we desire more of you, we want to learn more of you, and Lord, my prayer would be that you would minister through your word tonight. You would speak to each person here, whether we're here in this room right now or just watching afterwards. Lord, I pray that by your spirit, you would you would minister and do that work that only you can. So we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the power uh, in it. Uh, we thank you that it's living and that we can wholly trust in it and in you. Uh, and in that, Lord, open our eyes to see more of you tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we, we are in First Samuel chapter nine. Uh, we've been um, we've been here for about six, seven weeks now, and um, we're seeing a real time of transition in the history of the Jewish nation. Uh, the Old Testament is, is, is wonderful in many ways, uh, but as I've got older, I start to love history more and more, and particularly biblical history, as well as any other history. It's just really good to learn about what's gone on, because um, we, we do learn a lot from history. We, we learn so much from it, and we particularly learn about God when we're looking at the Bible, and about human character when we look at the Bible. We see what, um, what the human character is all about. And as we've been going from this time where we saw, um, we, we kind of narrowed down and specifically looked at Hannah and Elkaniah, and we saw the birth of Samuel, we saw this, this uh, young boy dedicated to the Lord and grow in the Lord and become the, the first prophet and last judge of the nation, Israel, or nearly the last judge. We're going to see uh, a couple of others here who are his sons. Oh, we touched on them last week. And then the transition comes because of what we learned last week, that uh, the nation cried out and asked for a king because they looked at the na nations around them. You know, if you remember back to, to where we were, that the nation Israel was basically was kind of wandering about doing the things that they thought were the right things to do in their own uh, thoughts and minds. They'd started to trust in, in the ark. They brought the, the ark of the covenant into the battle. Uh, and really one of the things that it reminded me of was I've been talking about Romans chapter 1 recently. And, and Romans chapter 1 tells us about uh, human nature and what happens when we uh, depart from worshipping God and it says in Romans chapter 1 I think verse 22 and they worshipped and served the creature rather than cr the creator and and again we, we see patterns of this happen and start to take place and we certainly saw it back there that, that the nation Israel trusted in the ark it got stolen they lost the battle um, and uh, those who had stolen it went through a tumultuous time uh, because of that and sent the ark back um, to the nation Israel and then as Samuel had got older they learned how to to act um, and to be responsible and to turn back to the Lord rather than uh, look into the ark or the other things that they'd started to do was to worship idols they'd been worshipping Baal and Ashtaroths and we we, we, we haven't got into great detail into what they are, but basically a weather god or a rain god and a fertility or um, uh, sexual god. That's what uh, these were, and the nation had started to worship idols. But what had happened when the ark came back and uh, Samuel instructed them what they had to do, they put away the idols 
the cities were restored and they lived in victory over the Philistines. The Philistines were their arch enemy. They were the ones that they um, had a lot of contention with uh, throughout this period of time. But at this time, when they turned away from the idols, came back to the Lord, they had victory over their enemies. And last week we saw Samuel grew old. His sons became judges. But uh, as we looked at chapter 8 last week, they turned aside to dishonest gain, they took bribes, and they perverted justice. Again, we, we see this pattern don't we we see if people are not walking with the lord staying close to the lord putting their trust in the lord serving the lord then what happens is we we are prone to wander you know our carnal nature will take control and we will we will wander down a path that will lead us into trouble basically it will lead us uh sin always leads us to death and here the issue was that Samuel's sons had turned aside and because of that, the people cried out and asked for a king. They didn't cry out to God first and foremostly. What they did was they looked at the situation that was going on. They saw Samuel getting old. They saw that these guys were dishonest. They looked around at the neighbours around them and thought, we want what they've got. And they demanded of Samuel a king. The Lord warned them through Samuel what would happen if they did this. Yet they still demanded a king. In chapter 8 verses 11 to 19 we see what the Lord says. And from verse 7 in chapter 8 we see that they chose an earthly king over a heavenly king. They rejected not Samuel. Samuel got upset and the, the Lord said, don't, don't be upset. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. And now they were going to live with the consequences of that. And here we go into chapter 9 and we see, or we come across this character called Saul, who becomes the first king of Israel. So I'm going to read... Um, I think the first 10 verses will stop and have a bit of a ref reflection and then we'll go on to the end. So here we go. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of Be Bekorath, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among all the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of the servants with you. Arise and go look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and through the land of Cilicia, but they did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Shalim, and they were not there. Then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they did not find them. And when they had come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and become worried about us. And he said to him, Look, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honourable man. All that he says surely comes to pass. So... Let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But look, if we go, what shall we bring to the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone, and there is no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here at hand one-fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give that to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer. For he who is called a prophet was formerly called a seer. Then Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Okay, so we'll stop there. 
really, I mean, all we're getting is the narrative of the story. We kind of get in the picture of what is going on. Uh, the picture of a family, the picture of another man, and, um, and some lost donkeys. Uh, that's kind of what's happening and what's going on right now. It's interesting, though, that uh, Jake, I think, mentioned when he came and, and did his teaching that the, the names in the Bible always seem to have, or, or do always, have a meaning. And the name Saul means asked of God, asked of God. We know that Israel asked for a king and Saul was in response, in name, somebody who was asked of God. Remember that Saul was born long before the nation cried out and asked. Uh, again, we, we see as we look at the word of God, we see the sovereignty of God, don't we? We see that he has always got a plan and a purpose, no matter how difficult or messy it is. Uh, it tells us a little bit of description about Saul. He was uh, shoulders upwards, he was taller than any of the people. That didn't mean that he had an exceptionally long neck. But what it meant was, and where we get our saying from, head and shoulders above the rest. Again, we see, don't we, when we look at the Bible, where we get some of our sayings from. Head and shoulders above the others. Well, Saul was just taller than anybody else in the land. Head and shoulders, so maybe a foot taller than anyone else. Which would suggest that maybe he's as tall as seven foot. And uh, so he was a big guy. He was a good looking man. Nobody as good looking as him. So we see that he came from a wealthy family. An influential family. He was good looking. But there's nothing said about his relationship with God. David Guzik says, there was nothing said because there was nothing to say. Actually, Saul reflected the spiritual state of the whole nation of Israel. There may have been some spiritual image present, but the heart was far from where God wanted it to be. And uh, we, we get this picture of Saul, this man asked of by the nation Israel, and he looked the part. He looked like he would fit uh, the description of a king. Again, interesting how, you know, in this, we, 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 we need to look at, as we look at the historical aspect of the Bible, we've, we're also to to reflect in our own lives, to ask ourselves the question, you know, and Jesus often did question those, the Pharisees and those who would look spiritual on the outside, but were empty on the inside. And it's so important that we are right with the Lord in our hearts. And, uh, and it seems as if Saul looked great on the outside, but there's just no mention of his relationship with God. So what do we get to see? Well, we get to see that the donkeys of Saul's dad, Kish, were lost. He'd sent him and a servant out to find them. And, uh, and off they went. Uh, just a few thoughts to, to get from, from this passage. Um, God can use what might be or could seem as a mundane task. Or those daily tasks of life that we don't really kind of think God's in or there's much going on that's very spiritual but he can use these tasks to accomplish really uh, significant spiritual plans and purposes that he has here we see that he's using some lost donkeys to reveal the king the first king of Israel this is what David Guzik says about this. There are two mistakes people make regarding God's guidance through circumstances. One mistake is to think every event of life is heavy with meaning from God. You know those types of people, don't you? I'm just going to kneel down and pray because I'm going out in the car. I need to make this decision. Do I need to buy these or these? So I'm going to ask the Lord. It's, it's kind of like we, we emphasize the point too much or put too much significance on on small things, that's what he's saying. This is wrong. Because though nothing happens by accident, 
Not everything happens for a great purpose. The second mistake is to ignore the moving of God in our lives through circumstances. God wanted to use this situation to guide Saul. And God will often use the circumstances in our lives in the same way. We need to trust in God's goodness and his ability to make all things work together for good, as it teaches us in Romans 8, 28. You see, there's a balance to find. Absolute trust in God. It's one of those things in my own life I don't struggle with <laughs> because I've made some horrendous decisions in my life. And I've really messed things up in, in time gone by. And God has always been faithful. So if I'm at a place where I'm seeking him, he's not going to let me down. Even if it feels like things aren't going right, or they're not how I imagine they should be doing, I trust him wholeheartedly. He is working things out for good because his word tells us that and because I've experienced that in my own life. Um, so as we go about, our, you know, we can often, or we can come across uh, situations where we find it difficult to make a, mis uh, to make a decision. And, and sometimes we've just got to step out and trust, Lord, I'm trusting you and I'm stepping out. Stop, stop me if I'm going the wrong way and guide me if I'm going the right way. Open the door or close the door, Lord, because I don't know what to do. But keep walking. Sometimes we stop and we become stagnant or ineffective but here we see an example of something a daily task of life go find the donkeys they've gone missing it would have been uh, something that would have been normal for these guys to do the donkeys would have been wild and at the time that they needed them to come in they would have gone out to find them to bring them back but in that God is doing an amazing and mighty work who knows what he's going to do in our lives tomorrow looking at this there could be the opportunity of you ending up as the ruler of a nation. Who knows what God's going to do? It happened here in Saul's life. We've seen it happen before in the Bible, in Joseph's life. From one day, he went from prisoner to prime minister in a day. A lot had gone before that, but God did a work quickly. And, and sometimes that's what happens. What we also see in this portion is that the men had limited spiritual understanding. They knew that there was a man of God and that they, they hoped that he would help them find the right way. They'd heard about Samuel. Another thing to, to think about is Samuel's reputation preceded him. You know, they'd heard that there was a man of God and that the things that he said came true. And, and the, again, just from that portion there, if we follow the Lord, if we are representing him in our families, with our friends, in our workplaces, does that reputation go before us? Not that we're always prophesying and saying things that are going to come to happen, but that we speak truth, that we are kind, that we're generous, we're tender-hearted, a good reputation. Because when people do need to seek some form of help, then the first person that they will come to is that person who they look to, who, who they can trust. You know, just some lessons for us to take out of that. Again, in examining our own lives, They talked about bringing a present to him and you know after we can get sometimes we can get a little bit confused uh, with this or we might wonder what it means and again uh, the enduring word commentary is quite helpful here he says there's no present there's no gift to bring the man of god and out of respect for samuel saul did not want to approach him empty-handed it's wrong to think that samuel was charged a fee for his prophetic services Samuel was a great prophet of the living God, not a fortune teller. And it would have been something, of, something cultural to bring at the time if you were coming to see uh, an oracle, a seer, a prophet, to bring something uh, to that person. Uh, this is where we see the word seer for the first time 
in the Bible. And it literally, the literal translation of seer means a person who sees, uh, particularly something supernatural. A seer and a prophet were the same in most cases, only with this difference. This is what Clark says. The seer was always a prophet, but the prophet was not always a seer. So that's what uh, Clark says. In Amos 7:12, we see it was common. It was a common courtesy to bring a gift to a prophet, whether that was a modest gift or a lavish gift. So. We know the story, the scene's set, the guys are wondering what to do. They think, how can we find the donkeys? Let's go ask the man of God. So we've got something to take to him now. Great idea, let's go and see him. Verse 11. As they went up the hill to the city, they met some, some young women going out to draw water and said to them, is the seer here? And they answered them and said, yes, there he is. Just ahead of you, hurry now. For today he came to this city because there is a sacrifice of the people today on the high place. As soon as you come into the city, you will surely find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now therefore go up, for about this time you will find him. So again, a chance encounter, or is it? They bump into uh, some people coming down from the village, ask them where the seer is. Oh, it just happens to be that he's here today. He came and he, he, he was coming to the city. He's coming to give sacrifice. He's going to bless the food. They're going to have a feast, and people who are invited to the feast can come and sit at the feast. Just think about the timing of the man of God being there. Was it a coincidence? I think not. God has a plan. And again, it's in these plans that we learn to trust him. We learn that through the, the, the ups and downs of life, through our decisions as we go about the things that we do, none of those things are a surprise to God. He brings about his plans and purposes. We will certainly see as we go through the story, there are ways that we can get in the way of that. There are things that we can do to, to obstruct that. There's our own carnal nature that takes us off as we wander. But ultimately, God is fulfilling his plans and purposes. And he is working all things out for good. Samuel sorry Saul he's told to carry on the, the road that he's going and he should soon bump into the seer or the man of God a person they know nothing about and they certainly don't know or won't have met him before uh, where do we get to 14 so they went up so they went up to the city and as they were coming into the city there was Samuel coming out towards them on his way up to the high place. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry has come to me. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, there he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. So here we see the encounter. We see the meeting. We see the, the prophet meets the man who is to be king. One of them knows exactly what's going on and what's about to happen. The other has no idea at all what is going on. He's just looking for his donkeys. There's a real contrast, isn't there? There's a contrast. Somebody who is, you know, is out on his task, is just going about his daily business, is looking for, 
well, becoming a bit more anxious about his dad's thoughts turning towards him, probably worrying about his dad, worrying about him, but oblivious to what is going on. In contrast to Samuel, who is dedicated to the Lord, who is and always has been obedient to the Lord, and who is in tune with the Lord. He's waiting for the Lord and for all that he is doing. And we see him commune with the Lord. Not only does he come and speak to God, but he hears from God. He's in a relationship with God. And he hears specifically God's plans for this person. This time tomorrow a Benjamite. That's pretty specific. And then when he sees him, the Lord says to him, that voice, this is him. And then we also, and again throughout the whole of the, the book, this book, we see the character of God. The nation had rejected what God had said to them in the previous chapter. God warned them that if they chose a king, there would be consequences for it or of it. But here we see the Lord graciously providing a king for the nation because he had heard their cry. That's so gracious. You know, it's one of those times where you think, well, if I were in charge, I'd just say, get off with you. I've told you what's going to happen. You know, you you lost. And it is no doubt they've chosen second best. And we're going to see the consequences of their choice over the next few chapters. But God still hears their cry. Still responds to a people, even though they are distant from him. In the previous chapter, in verse 7 of chapter 8, we see that it says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people, in that they say to you, For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should reign over them. The people rejected a heavenly king, and instead chose an earthly king. And they're going to they're gonna see the consequences of that. But even in that choice, we see God's grace and his patience towards the nation. How amazing is that? It reminded me of the verse that I've spoken on recently in 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He cannot deny himself. He's so faithful. He's so patient. When we knowingly or unknowingly wonder... And there are times when the Lord reveals things to us and we look back and think, Lord, forgive me for the times that I have done that. He has remained faithful in those times because he cannot deny himself. You know, as we go through the Old Testament, many, many people say, oh, you know, we see the God of, of vengeance, the God of the law uh, in the Old Testament. And no doubt there are some difficult things to read through in the Old Testament. It's... Hard going sometimes. But there are so many wonderful passages of God's grace throughout the Old and the New Testament. All of them pointing towards Jesus. He is so faithful and he's so good. And we see that here with a nation who have chosen an earthly king rather than a heavenly one. I've heard their cry. Uh, Guzik says this, uh, even though Israel rejected the Lord as their king, God was still in control. He didn't step off his throne just because Israel asked him to. He would indeed give them a king, but he sent a flawed king to a flawed Israel. One thing that did come true through what he had said, he will save my people from the hand of the Philistines. And though there are going to be, and we'll see, many problems with the reign of Saul, it wasn't a total disaster. Saul led Israel to many victories and a greater independence from 
the Philip Philistines. Another thing just to, to, to look at there as well is the Lord confirmed to Samuel that he was the man. And if the Lord... To be in tune, it's, it really is to, to be in tune with the Lord, to, to hear that small, quiet voice. When there's all that noise going on in the world around us, when there's the battle going on within us, but to hear his voice and we trust in him and we walk with him and we're obedient to him. We see here, and we, again we see many times throughout scripture that the Lord will confirm either through circumstance or here, we see that he spoke to him. He heard that voice. There are times in, in life that, that we might get to hear that voice, an audible voice. But the Lord confirmed it to him. And uh, we're only going to find out if we step out in faith. We're only going to know that, that word or the action of confirmation if we take the first step to say, okay, Lord, I'm trusting you and I'm going for it. But go for it and see him confirm it. Hear him confirm it as he did with Samuel here. Let's go on verse 18. Uh, then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me, where is the seer's house? Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today. And tomorrow... I will let you go, and I will tell you all that is in your heart. But as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and on your father's house? Uh, let's read the next verse. And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes, tribes of Israel? And my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Why then do you speak like this to me? This is a, a dramatic escalation in proceedings. Okay, this is where it's all of a sudden the direction that Saul is going in and everything that's filled in his mind suddenly comes to a, a crashing stop, a halt and a what on earth is going on well I can't imagine what must have been going on in Saul's mind right now uh, you know he's, he's, he's set on this task he's going about can you tell us where this, he's, he's facing Samuel so he didn't even you know this isn't somebody who's walking about in robes looking like the bishop of archbishop of Canterbury in his, in his fine attire it's somebody who would look like anybody else on the street and Saul's going up to him saying he tell me where the seer's house is? I need to go see him. Uh, I am the seer. I'm Samuel. And let me tell you about yourself. And, uh, and he goes on to tell him things that only... How could he know that he was out looking for his donkeys? How could he know such a thing other than the Lord had revealed it to him? He tells them, that the things that he is concerned about is all fine. Don't worry about that stuff. And he tells them that the desire of Israel was for a king. Maybe Saul did know that. I don't know. Maybe he wouldn't have that news. But basically, in this initial conversation that Saul has with the seer, or with the prophet Samuel, he tells Saul that he is the one that Israel is seeking. That's what it says there in verse uh, 20. But as for your donkeys, that they were lost, do not be anxious, they've been found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? The desire of Israel is on a king. Is it not on you and your father's house? <laughs> I'm sure there'd have been a hundred things racing through Saul's mind in how to answer this but he does answer and his response is humble and I've, I've read a few different commentaries on this um, some who think that it's a false humility 
uh, actually he's just trying to wriggle out of the situation and he's just saying what he thinks would be best to say in the situation. Some, like Clark again, who thinks that he is modest and he is humble. He says, this speech of Saul is exceedingly modest. He was now becomingly humble, but who can bear elevation and prosperity? And what Clark is saying is that he starts off as a humble person, but because of what is going to be bestowed upon him, he becomes the person that he becomes, and there's not many people can handle that kind of uh, power and an influence without it going to the head, basically. That's, that's what um, Clark is suggesting. But we do see that it's a humble response, but it's not altogether true. If we contrast uh, verse 21 with verse 1, it says, Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite? Yes. Of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? Well, yeah, Benjamites are, is the smallest tribe. And my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Question mark. Mm, I'm not sure about that, because if we look at what it says in verse 1, it says there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, who was the son of Abel, Zeror, uh, Becherath, a fire, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. So, so Saul, you know, again, there's just that hint of maybe there's a there's a there's a humility, but it, maybe it's not a, the the whole of the story, or maybe it's what Saul is just trying to say to to get out of what what's what's what he's hearing. I don't know, but I can only imagine what's going on in his mind. If you were out looking for your donkeys, and all of a sudden the man of God who you've gone to ask tells you you're going to be the king of Israel. Who knows what would come into your mind to what you'd say. But this is what came into Saul's mind and what he said. And obviously as we continue through our journey through the next few chapters, we're going to find out and see more of the character of Saul. But he's told that the, the prophet had come to anoint the feast, he'd come to bless uh, the sacrifice and the feast and that those who would be invited would come along but now Saul is going to be the guest of honour at the feast and that's that's what we're going to see again an, another surprise right you know you've been looking for the donkeys three days I bet they're not looking too good if anyone's been camping for more than three days you're not looking good at that point are you this isn't a place where there's shower blocks and toilets and all those things that can go and get refreshed at there may have been a well every now and again um, but now you're going to be coming to the feast as the guest of honour, you're probably going to be thinking, oh my goodness, uh, is there somewhere I could get ready or maybe freshen up or something? I don't know, but um, that's what's going on. Verse 22 says, Now Samuel took Saul and his servants and brought them into the hall and had them sit in the place of honour among those who were invited there were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion which I gave you, of which I said to you, set apart, set it apart. So the cook took up the thigh, which is its upper part, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, here it is, what was kept back. It was set apart for you, eat. For until this time, it has been kept for you. Since I said, I invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. So invited to sit at the place of honour. You know, in, in the, the culture of the time, there would have been a, a seating arrangement at these feasts, and there would have been a special protocol for those. Uh, the person of honour would probably be the... Uh, the, the I go, I go to, oh, I've go. had the privilege of being able to go to Africa and we get to go and to sit and have a meal with the chief of the town. And there's certain places where you have to sit if you go and have uh, this meal. And I can just picture what it would have been like. You sit there, you're of more importance, you're of less importance, so you sit further back. You're a bit more important, so you can sit there. Well, Saul was given the most important place to sit. 
and a great honour to be seated next to the prophet Samuel. He was also given the special piece of meat, the thigh, that was set apart. Again, cultural. Every meal that would have been, that had been a special portion given to the person or the, the guest of honour, as it were. So Saul was made a fuss of at this meal. And again, the reading through the the commentaries, it's, it, there are different suggestions for this. Maybe, you know, again, because, because Samuel recognized that God had chosen this man, Saul, to be king, and he wanted to honor him. Some suggesting that maybe it was a test, and Samuel was testing Saul to see what he would be like in this place. You know, sometimes you can give people that best place, and, and again, it goes straight to the head. It's like, woo! I can order everyone about now. I'm the boss and I'm the best person. Look at me. We don't know which it was because it doesn't tell us. All we know that it happened and he was given that place of honour. But either way, what it does tell us for us is that humility is important. And that you know, whatever God chooses for us to do, or wherever it is he chooses us to be, what, however the world might view that, whether that's the, the highest place of honour, I don't know, a king or president or prime minister, or the lowest place of a servant, wherever that may be, that we are humble in how we serve Jesus. Because the important part about our faith is, is are we faithful to what God has called us to do? And as we do that, are we humble in the way that we do it? I hope we're humble enough to, to be challenged in that area as well. If we do become conceited or proud in any way. Uh, and then finally, I'm, I don't think I'm going to go to 27, because really, 20, I might read it, but 27 is where chapter 10 continues from. But um, 25 says, When they had come down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the top of the house. They arose early, and it was about the dawning of the day that Samuel called to Saul on the top of the house, saying, Get up that I may send you on your way. And Saul arose, and both of them went outside, he and Samuel. And I'll read verse 27. It says, As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And he went on. But you stand here a while, that I may announce to you the word of God. So my portion or the chapter here we're looking at is that Saul has been chosen as king. The next chapter that we're looking at, chapter 10, is Saul anointed as king. And it starts off, that, that's the start, verse 27 is the start of the anointing of King Saul. But back to verse 25 where it says, When they had come down, so they've come down from the high place, from the meal, the place of honour, uh, into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the top of the house. So... The top of the house would have been the coolest place. You know, I imagine nights like this. You know, when you just sat on the top of the house, the sun's going down, you're at that temperature's just perfect. You've had your meal, you sat there, Samuel and Saul talking, and I'm sure I'm sure Saul was just asking question after question after question, and Samuel will have been giving him the answers that, that he had. What a day for Saul. I'm sure Samuel was, would have been telling him about, you know, the nation cried out. I, God told them that uh, this is what would happen if they asked for a king. You know, I'm, su I'm sure they, they, they went through all the things that Samuel has just been through. And even, uh, you know, because of my, what my sons have, have been doing, they cried out. God's heard the cry and he's, he'll have been, they'll have been talking about all of these things. 
Saul, I wonder how much sleep he got that night. <laughs> I, was, I was just looking for the donkeys. And now I've been told that I'm going to be the king of Israel. So much to talk about. So much to digest. But God had a plan. God had people in place. God still has a plan. And God has people in place today. If you're born again of his spirit, then you're his people. And you're in that place for a purpose and for a reason. Wherever that is and whatever it is that you're doing, God has a purpose for you there. And it may be that we're in the middle of tasks that seem difficult or we're getting anxious or the mundane or we've been asked to do things that we're not particularly fond of doing. And sometimes we, we need to be reminded or just said, you know, let's just take our eyes off these things, look to the Lord. Think about him. Understand that God is always faithful. Always. He can and he does use everyday situations to fulfill his plans and purposes. And God is, is looking for far more than Saul and the servant were doing, which is just looking for an answer to their problems. God is looking for a relationship like he had with Samuel, where Samuel knew exactly what was going on. He spoke to God, God spoke to him. Whereas Saul wandered straight into a situation and knew nothing. And we need to understand that humility is always good. And we need to be people who are humble. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for, for your word to us uh, tonight. We thank you for, for the history, Lord, for the, uh, the understanding that you give us through these events that took place centuries ago. We thank you, Lord, that they are our uh, foundation that we stand upon. And as we look to them, Lord, we, we pray that in our own lives, you would help us to, to look to you, to live for you, to honour you. And whatever it may be, small or great, of uh, worldly significance or just overlooked, Lord, that you would fulfil your plans and purposes in our lives. And that we would, um, we would be a Samuel, Lord. We would be in tune. We would be obedient. We would hear your voice and, uh, and follow after you. And you, you would help us to be humble. Help us to serve. Help us, Lord, to, to, to keep our eyes upon you, even when it gets tough. And, uh, and it can be sometimes. Lord, we know that we're prone to wander. Help us to keep on that narrow path. Lord, would you guide us when we, we, we begin? Lord, may it be so evident in our own minds that we're wandering off and that we would come back to you. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for this beautiful evening. And we pray your blessing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen.